So how is everyone today? <laughs> okay, so last time, the last thing we had talked about last time, started to talk about, was distance. So let's continue that. Yes? How do you cancel a C that the test is I do not know the answer. So you mean like you scheduled? And then I have something that I can have to do. I don't know. I think the best thing is probably to call them. Okay. So, this is where we were last time. We had an axis. We had two points. We had the line segment. No, the segment, not the dashed line. We had the segment connecting them, and the point was is that we wanted to measure that length. Uh, we have a ruler that can be held horizontally. We have a ruler that can be held vertically, but it is forbidden to turn your ruler at an angle and measure, measure it like so. You're only allowed to measure horizontally and vertically. So, supposing that we drop this down and write that that's x1 and drop this down and this x2 and then drop them to the other side y1 y2 then this shape right here is a right triangle and as we discussed, the length of this side is absolute value x2 minus x1. And the length of this side is absolute value y2 minus y1. And then we now have the legs of the hy uh, we have the legs of a right triangle and we want the le length of the hypotenuse. So the Pythagorean theorem. tells us the following. It says that if we, if we give the hypotenuse the name D, so we give the hypotenuse name D, then D squared is what? Right. The horizontal one squared plus the vertical one, all squared. So this would be x2 minus x1, square that, plus y2 minus y1, square that. Okay, the Pythagorean theorem is, is telling us that. So now, I'm gonna do something and I want you to tell me what it is that I've done and whether or not it is permitted. Okay, so what is it that I did? Okay, and I, I changed them to parentheses. Is that okay to have done that? Let's think about it for a moment. Supposing that this is, this is 2 and that's 8, then we'd be doing 8 minus 2 and we'd get a 6, right? We'd get a 6, uh, fine. And then if we, if we did it in the opposite order, if instead of doing 8 minus 2, we did 2 minus 8, what would we get? Negative 6 which is the purpose of these, of these absolute value bars right here, is they make sure that we always get the, the non-negative version of the number. 
So now, what, what about right here? What if, if x2 minus x1 were 6, then we'd square it and we'd get six, and 36, right? What if we accidentally did it the other way, for example, and got negative 6? You get the same thing. Why would you get the same thing? Because you're right, because the negatives will cancel when you square it. Okay? So as a result, yes. Yes, it is permitted to drop these absolute values. Here it would not be permitted. You couldn't drop these. But for this step, yes, you can. Uh, then, <coughs> solving. Here we go. So here is the distance formula. It is a formula that you're now expected to memorize. Okay, so I could give you an example. So for example, find the distance from 2, 0 to 1, 7. Okay, so in the interest of time, the formula will look like this. So something squared plus other thing squared. And in this set of the in this set of parentheses, you have to do the difference in the x's. Okay, it's the difference in the x's. So one one mistake that that uh, one kind of mistake that students make is they try to do the difference of these two values, say, 2 minus 0. But what, why is that not right? Because this is an x and also a y. So what's happening here is that you can put the x's here, 2 and 1. Right, so it's the difference in the in the x's. So 2 minus 1. And then the other one needs to be the difference in the y's. Like so. So any question about what, when, where, and why. Okay, so that would mean that the distance is the square root of, well, 2 minus 1 is 1, square that is 1, and then plus 0 minus 7 is negative 7, square that, 49. So the square root of 50, and then typically on such exercises, you're requested to simplify the radical. Can this radical be simplified? Did I make an error somewhere? <laughs> um, yeah. Um, That's the same question. Minus 2 and 7 minus 0. Okay, so by way of answering your question, I, I, I have a counter question. Okay. Suppose that, suppose that, um, this is not true, but suppose that the distance from Dallas to Houston were 200 miles. Then what's the distance from Houston to Dallas? 200 miles, right? Because after all, if, if, if traveling Dallas to Houston is 200, then surely traveling 
Houston to Dallas is 200. So my counter question is, as you said, I thought we were computing the distance from that one to that one. <laughs> but you appear to be computing the distance from that one to that one. Well, I just got a different answer, so. You got a different answer? Wow. I, I, didn't, I, I got the same answer, but I did it the way you have it with x2 minus x1. Okay, well. Let me check. <laughs> Two, Wait. one, one. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I have the right answer. You do. I do. <laughs> okay. Other other questions. So can so can this radical be simplified? Yes. R yes, because this is two multiplied by twenty five, right? And then when twenty five is in the radical, what can come out? Five. A five. So after that, it would be five square root two. Any question about this? <clears throat> okay. So another aspect that we need to know is midpoint. So in the case of the line, We want, uh, we want midpoint. So here's a point, here's a point. So we'll call this point A and this point B. And then by midpoint, what we're talking about is we want the point that's exactly halfway between. OK, so now let's see if we can come up with, with the right answer. What is, what is the midpoint between 10 and 20? 15. 15. Okay, great. Uh, what is the midpoint between negative 3 and 17? I heard someone say it. What is it? 7. Okay, so the first one is pretty easy. My experience tells me when I have, whenever I ask students about what it is that they're doing. So when I said, I want you to compute the midpoint between 10 and 20, I, I imagine that the majority of you did the following. You said to yourself, self, uh, well, what's the distance between 10 and 20? 10. And what's half a 10? 5. And if I add that to 10, because that was the left end point, I get 15. That's the way most humans seem to think about this normally. And then that all breaks down <laughs> when I give you one of them has, is, a, is a negative number. <laughs> then it's like, I don't know, forget it. <laughs> I refuse. So, so consider the, 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 the 10 and 20 again. So what's the sum of 10 and 20? 30. And what's half of that? 15. Okay, now let's consider again, what's the, what's the sum of negative 3 and 17? Negative 3 and 17. 14. 14. And what's half of that? 7. The answer. Okay. So the formula is, for midpoint, it's average. A plus B over 2. And even though that's the case, even though that's the case, uh, most, most humans rather, e even though that's so simple in comparison, right? Negative 3 plus 17 over 2 is, uh, is 7. Most, most uh, human beings do this. Half the difference, the first one plus half the difference. That's what most, stu most students do, most human beings do, unless, unless you explicitly tell them to do it this way. <laughs> These two formulas are the same. OK, good. Now let's do it on the plane. So again, we have two points.
the line segment connecting them. And we still have these rulers that aren't allowed to be turned at angles. Yeah, these aren't very good rulers. Who's making these? <laughs> we, want the, we want the point on that line segment that's exactly halfway between uh, the two end points. So we want that point that's right in the middle, right there. Okay, but we're not allowed to, not allowed to use a diagonal ruler. Okay, so we'll start out just like with the distance. We'll say, okay, we need to go ahead and figure out these, these things. So here's x1 and x2. And then y1 and y2. <clears throat> okay, and what I'd like for you to observe is that now on the horizontal axis, on the horizontal axis, we have a one dimensional problem, just like this one. I could ask, well, what's the midpoint of the x's? In the first place, it's about right there, right? But what's its value? Right, x1 plus x2 over 2 is the average x. So this is <clears throat> x1 plus x2 over 2. Similarly, we can do this with the y's, y's midpoint is about right there. And I could ask, what is the, what is the formula for y's midpoint? Y1 plus y2 over 2. Very good. Okay, average y. Now, here's the trick. So, we started out with these points, and then to deal with them, we went back to the horizontal axis and back to the vertical axis and got these, these two. So now we're going to go back out into the plane and say, OK. There it is. <laughs> I had to draw a really big dot because I apparently didn't hit exactly the midpoint on one of them. <laughs> That's the trick, is big, big dots. <laughs> okay. So, what that's saying is that if, it, if this is M, then the formula for M is <clears throat> that the midpoint, the X coordinate, is the average X, and the Y coordinate is the average Y. So I could say, find the midpoint of uh, the points 1, 3, and 1, 4. So what are the two x values? 1 and 1. So the x coordinate of the midpoint is the average x. Add them up, divide by 2. And the y coordinate of the midpoint is the average y, which, after a little bit of calculation, is 1 and 3 and a half.
or seven over two. Any question about this? Okay. So now, move to something slightly different. So now we're going to talk about intervals. So, yes? So, if it's, if it's like a symmetrical triangle, like it's A and 4, like it's easy, can you just go up to and go over 4 and like go right there and if it's on a point, just like, you know what I'm saying, like guesstimate it without doing all that other stuff? Well, I want to see you use the formula. Right. Okay. That, that's, what, that's what, in the end, what I want to see. Because, like, on the homework, you could have gone up, you know, and figured out the midpoint without doing it. Ah, uh, from plotting it. Right. Yeah, okay. I, I, I suppose, yeah, but I still want to see you, you use the formula. The formula yeah, because okay. yeah, that's what we're learning. Be because the, the thing is, is that on, on this exercise, the, one of the things that, that's, that's terrific about humans, okay, is that you can give you can give even young children very young children you can give them a line and say two points and then you I could say give me the one give me the point that's right in the middle they'll get to they'll get extremely close to the exact middle this this is a problem that that human beings are just more or less innately able to solve okay so then that's not what what's being tested, because <laughs> right? we we can all do that. <laughs> I want to see you use the formula. Okay, so uh, when you depict the set of reels, it's depicted as a line, uh, as a, that, that that extends infinitely far in both directions. An interval is one piece of that line, just a, just one piece. So we're going to talk about intervals briefly, and it's going to be set up in three columns. So the first column is going to be an algebraic inequality. The second column is going to be a plot. And the third column is going to be a new thing that we're going to call interval notation. Okay. So for the algebraic inequality, I'd like for you to consider something like A less than X less than B. To give you a specific example, how about 1 less than X less than 5. Okay. So, would you please, someone, tell me some x's which satisfy this inequality? 2. 2, 3, and 4. Any other x's? Okay, good. Pi. How about pi? Pi does. Right? So does 4.9. So does 1.000001. Okay, does 1 satisfy this? No. Neither does 5. Okay, but uh, to, I want to make it absolutely clear that there are numbers other than integers. Yes, 2, 3, and 4 satisfy this. But those are not the only numbers which do. So do 2.1, 3.1, and 4.1, for example. Good. So when you plot this, because, because this represents a piece of the line, it's, it's, it's the piece of the line that's, that's more than 1 and also less than 5, it looks like a line when you draw it. So it's going to look like a little piece of line. Now, to signify uh, that we don't get, for example, 1, 
we don't get one. The way that you draw that is you draw this piece of line and then you draw an open circle, an, uh, a circle that's not filled in on the left and label that one. And you do uh, the analogous thing on the right with five. So here, the generic case, it looks like this, A to B. In interval notation, this is denoted in this way, A, B. So as a specific example, one to five. So I'd like to point out an unfortunate coincidence and that is that this notation for the set of numbers between 1 and 5, not including 1, not including 5, is exactly the same notation as the notation used for the point located at position 1, 5. That's just an unfortunate coincidence. I wish it were not that way. But it is. So when you, when you read this, when you read things like this, you need to very carefully check for context. Is this referring to an interval or is it referring to a point? Okay, we can vary this game just a little bit. What if we consider a less or equal to x less than uh, b? So as a specific example, 1 less or equal x less than 5. So what's the difference between the pre this and the, the previous? less or equal. So uh, what new point does in fact satisfy this inequality? One satisfies it. One satisfies this one but not not the previous one. So as a result this is still a piece of line piece of the line an, an interval but we have to have some way to draw it differently so that the reader can understand that we do in fact get the left endpoint. Yes? Right. So the, this we're going to draw filled in, which means that yes, we are, we are including that point. Okay, similar, similarly in the interval notation, to signify that you do have, that you are including one and a, the way that you draw it is with the square parentheses, which is called a bracket. Okay, so if it's good for the left endpoint, it's good for the right endpoint. So a less than x less or equal to b, 1 less than x less or, less or equal to 5 for a specific example. So how is this the same and uh, yet different than the previous one? Right, right. So the inequality is that, okay, instead of making that one less or equal, I made the other one less or equal. Okay. So now the picture looks like this. Oops. B. B. Five. Okay, and then how is the how is the interval notation going to be written? Good. No real surprises here, I think. Mm-hmm. Okay, so if you can do it to just one or just the other, then you could do it to both. So let's do that. Just write that down really quick. A less or equal X less or equal uh, B. One less or equal X less or equal five. And then the way you denote <clears throat> this situation is with square brackets on both sides.
Good. And it seems like this is where I would stop, but I'm going to keep going now. Yep. Uh, how about this one? Mm, X greater than uh, A. So as a specific example, X greater than 1. So how is this different than the previous kind? Yeah, it's one-sided. So all the previous ones, the inequality was an X was between two things. You had an X between an A and a B. Maybe you were including A, maybe you were including B. But here, we don't have X between two things. So let's, let's uh, make it look more like X is between two things uh, by remembering the following mathematical idea. There's a mathematical symbol, which is not a number, but it represents a quantity that's bigger than, than, than any number. And what's the name for this symbol? Infinity, right? So, so this means that x is more than a. So a is less than x, right? The, these two are the same, x more than a, a less than x. So now I'm going to say also less than infinity, because of course it is. So now, writing it in that way, ah, x is between two things. I feel comfortable again. So you could write the specific one as 1 less than x less than infinity. OK. Then this also is a piece of line. Drawn in that way. And then how, how will we write this with intervals? Bracket, A, so is it bracket for A? Or no, parentheses. Parentheses for A to infinity. And 1 to infinity. So now, I think you could imagine that I could go on and, and change 1 <laughs> just one of them to infinity, and then I could do open and closed for the other one. Change, open, okay, well, let's, let's not do that. But what I, wanna re what I want you to understand is that uh, infinity and negative infinity are not real numbers. They're not real numbers. What they are is they're, they're a symbol that, that infinity is a, is, is a thing that is always greater than every real. And negative infinity is a thing that is always less than every real. As a result, but, but nevertheless, infinity and negative infinity are not real. As a result, <coughs> this thing that I'm writing here, 1 to infinity, is always wrong. Why is that? Right. Because these intervals are, are, are subsets of the reals. They're pieces of the real line. For you, to, for you to write a square bracket on the infinity is to say, like, the infinity's in there. But infinity is not a real number, so you can't you can't put an infinity in my in my real set of real numbers. Thank you. <laughs> it would be like going to the grocery store and buying a bag of oranges, getting home, opening it, and finding a potato. You don't belong in here, right? <laughs> you just don't belong. Okay, same thing with this. Okay, good. Any question about this? Okay, so the next thing is intersection.
So the intersection of sets A and B is denoted so in the first place is anyone remember remember how you write the intersection of sets A and B yeah I see some people doing it there okay so A and then intersect B so that thing is called the intersection symbol denoted A intersect B and it is the set of all elements in both A and B. So the state of Texas assures me that you're familiar with this, uh, but just in case you need a brief reminder. Uh, the way that this is drawn in grade school is with a Venn diagram where this is set A, this one set B, and then where in this Venn diagram is the intersection. Right, that, that sliver in the middle there. All of this red stuff I'm coloring red is the stuff that is in set A and also in set B. It's in both. Okay, so as a result, for example, I could say, well, what if set A is uh, one, two, three, four, five? and set B is uh, uh, 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. So as a reminder, these curly parentheses, that, that means that we're talking about a set. So this A is this is a set that contains exactly uh, five elements. They are one, two, three, four, and five. And B is a set that contains exactly six elements. And there they are. Uh, the, the proper name for curly parentheses is brace. So I could ask, well, what is the intersection of A and B? Two and four. Good, because what we're asking ourselves is what elements are in both. So in the case of finite sets like this, you can do it as follows. You can say, ah, I see that there's a 1 in A. Is a 1 also in B? Then, then, it, then 1 is not in the intersection. I see that there's a 2 in A. Is the 2 also in B? Yes. So the 2 is in the intersection. I see there's a 3 in A. Is there also a 3 in B? There is not, so 3 is not in the intersection. I see there's a 4 in A. Is there a 4 in B? Yes, so 4 is in the intersection. 5 is in A, but not in B. Okay, And you don't need to do the same thing with B because, well, you would have just try it for yourself and see. Okay. So. So there you go. How about, uh, how about another one? Uh, what if we say that set X is, um, <clears throat> say, uh, odd numbers 1, 3, 5, and 7, and 9, and set Y is even numbers 0, 2, and 4? How about that? then what's the intersection of X and Y? So what, what, 
how many things are in the, the intersection? No things, right? So the set is empty. So the way you write that is uh, like that. The set which contains nothing, which is called the empty set. Uh, another way to write this, doesn't really matter for our class, but just for those of you who like to know all the fancy math uh, jargon, the way that you write the empty set is like, like that. So the whole, the whole, whole purpose here is for you to understand that it is perfectly reasonable for there to be no things which satisfy this. For example, I could, I could, I could say, um, you know, please, <laughs> everyone who is both uh, less than five feet tall and more than six feet tall, please stand up. Right? <laughs> okay, no, no one can satisfy those conditions. Okay. Did you have a question? It's not undefined. It's that it's empty. It's that it's empty. It's the same thing. It's the same thing as saying, let's consider the set of all football games that UTD has been involved in. It's empty, right? It's empty. Therefore, therefore, uh, you know, you can say things about it. Have we ever lost a game? That means we're un that means we're undefeated. Undefeated. <laughs> Okay, have we ever lost a championship? No. Ah, there you go. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect record. Okay. So now, the, the point is, of going over that, is so we can say things like the following. Let interval A be, uh, for example, 5 to 20, and let interval B uh, be the interval, say, um, 3 to 14, or something like this. And what I want to ask of you is I want you to compute the intersection. Of A and B. Okay, so this is a little tricky. A little tricky, mm -hmm. unless you're kind of good at uh, visualizing things. So, I'll show you a method to get it right every time. So, I'm going to draw interval A, I'm going to draw interval B, and I'm going to draw the intersection. So. Uh, I'll call I'll call this the red set and that the green set. So I want you to consider there are four numbers in play. There's five and twenty and three and fourteen. Four numbers. Of these four numbers, which is the smallest? Three. So I'm going to draw three. Furthest to the left, and put a three right there. And I'm drawing it open. Why am I drawing it open? Because it's not included, right? So now, there's just three numbers left because we took away that one. So of the numbers 5, 20, and 14, which one is the smallest? Five. So I'm going to go just a little bit further to the right, and on this line, I'm going to draw five. And I'll fill it in because we do have a five. Okay, now we cross that one off the list. So of the numbers 20 and 14, which one is the smallest? 14, so I'm going to draw it a little bit further to the right, and I'm going to draw it open, uh, 14. So that means that the B interval is everything between 3 and 14. Okay, so now we cross 14 off the list. So uh, of all the remaining, remaining numbers, 20, which one is the smallest? 20, right? <laughs> the only one. So I'll draw it right here, further than to the right than 14. And so this is the red interval. Okay, now to try and make it clear, 
I'll erase that bit and that bit and that bit. So to be in the intersection means that we have points that are both red and green. So how about, how about over here, these points right here? Uh, is, that, is that point right there a green point? It is not, and it is not a red point either. So here we go. <coughs> do, 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 do. Oh, I can see that the green points are going to start now. So does that mean that I'm in the intersection? No, not yet, right? Because we have to get to a red point it, 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 that's also green. Do, 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 do. Oh, now we have, a, now we have a, a point that is both red and green. So can you, can you see that that's where the intersection begins? That's where the intersection begins. And then how far can we go until we run out of points which are both red and green? We can make it to 14. So what's the answer to the question? 5 to 14. Oh, and, and 5 is open or closed? 14 is open or closed? 5 closed, 14 open. Now, if we were to move the red and the green far enough apart, you know, if I, if I grabbed this red and pulled it over here, way over here, then what would the intersection be? It'd be empty, and that's an okay thing. It's okay for the intersection to be empty. Okay, so have a nice Monday. <clears throat>